um, email address. Also. I know. Or, or one once thing, again. Uh, yes. And I know one thing that uh, CK, uh, as chair of the board, people don't understand that Reverend is all there. You know, these Parkinson's takes away your ability to move well, your ability to speak well, because it's a, it's a you know, a muscle deterioration disease. And people don't understand that it doesn't affect the way he thinks, that his heart and his soul is still there for all of our causes. And that's what's so beautiful about him. And CK, is there any word that you want to say to Mrs. Day before we end this part of the show? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Daryl, uh, why don't Miss Day, I want to thank you tremendously for being on the show. Daryl, did you have a word before we move to the next segment? Yeah, Barbara. You know, uh, Miss Day, thank you for what you're doing, uh, for continuing to fight for Jelani. It's truly appreciated. I know that uh, Jelani, if I, if, I remo- if I recall correctly, was uh, was an Omega Psi Phi, was part of the Divine Nine family. So I certainly encourage you know everyone to try to give to support the Jelani Day Foundation. Let's get justice for Jelani. Let's get everything uh, unclosed, un- undiscovered, and find out now what exactly went on so we can get justice for Jelani. Miss Day, thank you so much for for being Thanks. on the show. Thank you so much for all you're doing. Thank you so much for being a loving caring and tirelessly fighting for your son, uh, mom. Thank you so much, Ms. Day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Armwine. Thank you for Thank having you. me on the show. Thank you. Well, you'll be sister. back on. We're going to have you some more because we yes. got to do this work. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, is uh, Maureen Edelbar on the show? I am. All right, Maureen, you are one of our nation's most amazing voting rights experts. Uh, You teach uh, voting rights uh, and you work tirelessly. Uh, You have a career of having worked on the Hill, uh, you know, with the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, You've seen power in all of these exercises. Can you tell our national audience? And also, you are a T, like Edward, you're a TJC alum. You were at the uh, convince, you're here at the Democratic National Convention. Can you tell our national audience what it has meant to you to be there last night uh, in all of its um, ramifications? You know, what did you feel? What did you learn? What did you just come out of there thinking about? Just share that with our national audience. Absolutely. I really want to pick up on a thread that Reverend Ward and President Hoffler mentioned, and that is centralizing the work of Reverend Jesse Jackson, um, who has really paved the way for the moment we are in now. You know, as Edward said, and as President Hoffler said, when Reverend Jackson, you know, came out to the stage, he received a standing ovation. I mean, and he didn't even have to say a word. His presence was applause worthy. When I'm here at the DNC, I'm thinking about his 1984 Democratic Convention speech in San Francisco. I think he said something in his speech to the effect of America is like a quilt. There's many patches, many pieces, many colors, sizes, but we're all woven and held together by a common thread. I think his speech came to be known as the Rainbow Coalition speech. It was really, you know, what gave him the momentum to seek the nomination again in 1988. And when we talk about the moment we're in now with the potential election of the first woman president who is a black woman, a biracial woman of color, I think about the coalition, the rainbow coalition that Reverend Jackson created, bringing together black people, Latinos, the economically disadvantaged, the elderly, reaching out to voters who had not been approached to be registered. You know, Reverend Jackson brought in, I believe, 2 million new voters into the electorate between 84 and 88. And that is the coalition that is coming together for this historic convention. 
to nominate or have Vice President Harris accept the nomination for the Democratic candidate for president. So while I'm here, I just I think of the through line. I think of how Vice President Harris has called Reverend Jackson one of America's greatest patriots, and that he is. You know, it was so powerful to see um, many people joining Reverend Jackson on the stage to celebrate him. We had the Chicago okay. mayor, Brandon Johnson. Yeah. We had uh, California Representative Maxine Waters, who ha- had an amazing speech. The, the video montage of Reverend Jackson's career yeah. and a legacy yeah. was just remarkable. And as he was on the stage, sort of thrusting his arms skyward and grinning, I felt that there was power in that room. There is a civil rights through line in this city, and I am so grateful to witness such a historic moment. Wow. Wow. Daryl? And, you know, um, Maureen, we have a a deadline that's coming up. (laughs) People that are interested in signing up to be part of the Gen Z uh, Young Millennial Training Class. And, you know, um, you were in Houston when we came down there about a year and a half, two years ago, and we had the voting rights reception, and Reverend Jackson flew down from Chicago to be there, uh, um, as well as Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and had the yeah. opportunity certainly to, uh, to to talk to Reverend Jackson, to meet with uh, Congresswoman she- uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. If there, if, if there are people that are thinking about whether or not they should get involved uh, in this training class that we put on, that TJC puts on for the Gen Z, what would you, what, why would you tell them to get involved? Oh, man, I would say run and do not walk to the upcoming Transformative Justice Coalition training alongside <laughs> the Congressional Black Caucus's annual legislative <laughs> conference next month. It is a powerful convening where you will be around people, like-minded people, justice-minded people who care about the least of us and who understand that when we improve conditions for the people who are suffering the most, we all win. Um, It is a convening where you learn things you have never known before. It's a convening where you are in community with beautiful, inspiring people that these relationships carry on through the years. You know, I'm still very good friends with a number of the people I entered the training in with about a year ago. It is truly transformative, (laughs) um, for lack of a better word. And if anyone is considering applying please do. It is an experience of a lifetime, and it will change you forever and really teach you the grassroots communication and policy skills you need to go out into the world and create the change that we all seek. And we want everyone listening to know Thank you, Maureen. That was just gorgeous. We want everyone listening to know that you can apply uh, to be part of the class, the application, you can find uh, information to send you to the application to apply. The deadline is Friday the 23rd at 12 p.m., right? Uh, you know, so, uh, so we want, you know, I'm sorry, at 12 a.m., and we want everyone, everyone before midnight on Friday, if you're going to apply, we need you to go to tjcoalition.org. T J org. The application is also more prominently on votingrightsalliance.org. Uh, so please use those resources. And let me go to Edward. Edward, uh, why should people attend this training? Why should they apply to attend this training? Yeah, I, I think uh, Attorney Edelbar put it perfectly. I mean, um, one thing yeah. I've learned, if not uh, last night, is aside, uh, along with what uh, Maureen said, one thing I learned last night just being in the room is that yeah. when we talk about our vote, uh, our vote is not just our power. Our vote is not just our voice. But based on what I've seen in the room last night at the convention, your vote is also your lifeline. Because women's reproductive ah. rights are on the ballot. And so it's necessary because this is really a matter of life and death. And so we have to shift the way we think about our vote. 
And so young people getting involved is absolutely necessary because there needs to be a transference of power from the establishment to young people who will take on the mantle. But in order to get the mantle, you have to understand what you're up against. And these trainings point out, highlight, and target all of the red areas of what we're up against. So it's absolutely necessary to get involved because this gives us and equips us with the tools and skills that we need to go back into our respective communities and do what we need to do. And I'll tell you, that's why when I'm on the floor of the convention and I'll be there all four days, I've already done it so far and will continue to do it, is when I'm scoping out young people to make sure they have the link so they can apply to make sure that they show up because we can't back down and we won't go back as they said, right? And I know TJC is not partisan, <laughs> but I continue to uh, let folks know, even on the floor, folks are like, well, how do I sign up? How do I get involved? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's a link. I need you to sign up immediately. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and you know, where people are, are listening, they're like, okay, you know, this sounds all theoretical and everything. They're going to be teaching all this theory and, and, and you know, but, but it's not really practical. I, I don't know how I'm really going to apply this stuff. You know, I, I think that you had a, a very practical experience when you went to vote in Chicago uh, not too uh, far ago, uh, long ago, with your wife while you're waiting in line. Could you share that with our audience? Yes. Uh, so a part of the law uh, stipulates that you have to, uh, that if you're in line before 7 o'clock p.m., then you have the right to vote. Uh, one of the issues that typically uh, happened when we got in line, it was about 6.58. Right. And so the law says you have to be in line at uh, by seven o'clock or you cannot vote. We got a line at six fifty eight and the folks told us, told my wife that she could not vote. And they told her that, uh, you know, she had to uh, get out of line or she missed the, uh, the opportunity to vote. And I said to them, absolutely not. You, uh, the law stipulates <laughs> that you have to give her the right to vote. You have to give her a ballot because she was in line by seven uh, before 7 p.m. They looked at me. They got quiet. They locked their faces, were upset clearly and, and ended up giving her a ballot to vote. And I didn't know that that was the case before I went to uh, the uh, TJC uh, training. But afterwards, I realized these are small ways that they're attempting to infringe upon your right to vote or to suppress your right to vote. And so knowing that after the training, I'm like, oh, yeah, you got to come on with it, because I guarantee you, if we don't fight for us, <laughs> nobody else will. Amen. Uh, uh, Attorney Hoffler, uh, are you there? Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted Maureen uh, to talk about is uh, one of the people that Harris uh, has invoked in all of her speeches a lot is one Shirley Chisholm. And every time I think about Shirley Chisholm running for president uh, in 1972, and I hope people have seen that amazing movie on Shirley Chisholm. It is so gorgeous. Uh, but you realize that the rules defeated her, right? It was the rules that defeated her. I mean, she had an incredible strategy that Obama ended up using in 2008. But the difference in the strategy, her state strategy, was that there was a Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson who cha who forced the Democratic Party to change their rules? Can you tell people about what what we are talking about when we talk about force the change of the rules? Yes, absolutely. Right. I'm so yeah. glad you brought up, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought up Shirley Chisholm because yes, not about <laughs> without acknowledging her, right? You know. A school teacher, an author, the first black congresswoman, and most impressively, the first black major party candidate to run for president. And you're right, Barbara, she had to fight to be included in the primary debates because of yeah. racism, because of the glass ceiling. You know, she famously said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring in a folding chair. She also said, I believe tremendous amounts of talent are lost to our society because that talent wears a skirt. And this is a moment in which we are challenging that. And I think we see so much pushback from the media, certainly from uh, Donald Trump and some of those other sorts of conservative people who are really trying to invoke some sort of identity politics to speak huh. to uh, the fact that they believe Kamala Harris is some sort of 
phony, right, that she's trafficking on her gender and race to win this election, but it is her gender and her race and her life experiences, her lived experiences that make her such a wonderful candidate. You know, this is not a deep 